G'day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here with an Aero Hillbilly Enterprises video for the true believers of the Volma Jensen tribe. Speaking here specifically of Gregory Dahl and Chopper Girl Air War. She being the queen of the VJ24, because she's got about three of them. And Greg being the only person I know of who's currently building a VJ23G. His own take on the Volmer Jensen swing wing. This one doesn't have an expensive aircraft grade plywood single web spar. This has Greg's own redundant frame Warren Girder wing truss, I think it is. Very well worth looking at. Anyway, yesterday, perhaps the day before. So yesterday when I was uh, watching this video, where he gets into the mysteries of the differential ailerons. which Volma Jensen designed, and he seemed to find it unusual. And there was a bit of a bit of a discussion going on between Greg and the chopper girl. So, of course, I just had to live up to my channel name and get involved with a great big long post, which was actually appreciated. And, uh, and, and we had a bit of a discussion culminating in me saying that I'll open up the aeroplane trailer and shoot you a video of it. It being... 22 horsepower VJ24W, which back in the day used to look like that, or even like that. Both of them seemed a bit nonplussed at the idea that on the plans for the VJ23E swing wing that Greg's building. Everything seems to be set up so that the ailerons only move up rather than having some downward movement so that when one gives full right stick you get a lot of movement. Right stick involves making this, the right wing, go down. So that's full deflection. Taking all the curvature out of the outboard end of the wing, stopping that part of the wing from making lift and allowing that side of the aeroplane to drop. Roll the other way, and that's all you get to try and increase the lift on this side. Differential ailerons. I think they kicked in sometime between 1922 and 1925, because the Gypsy Moth and the Avro Avian both had differential ailerons in the second half of the 1920s. Now the reason differential ailerons took over so rapidly is because if you have both ailerons move the same amount up and down, then when you try to roll to the right, the left-hand aileron goes down as much as the right-hand aileron goes up, and the increased curvature on the outboard part of the wing means that it actually deflects more air downwards, and therefore it makes more lift than the inner portion of the wing makes more lift because it has more curvature makes more lift means that it generates more drag and the extra drag out there on the wingtip 
means that if you are trying to roll to the left, the aeroplane will yaw to the right. So while you're trying to roll left, the downgoing aileron, which is supposed to generate the extra lift so that you can roll to the left, generates yaw that makes you turn your nose to the right while rolling left. This was inconvenient because it meant that you had to be quite coordinated with your little footsies on the rudder bar if you would have any hope at all whatsoever of making a coordinated turn. So when they discovered that by having the actuation arm offset by 20, 25 degrees, maybe even 30 degrees, uh, call it 20, from the perpendicular line between the driven arms of the bell crank, it became pretty easy to set things up so that one way the bell crank got a lot of travel and the other way it got very little travel. And so, in the 1920s, differential ailerons became the norm, and it meant that in a powered aeroplane, you could, quote, bank and yank. You could just roll, pull back. You didn't have to worry too much about the rudder except when you're on the ground. One effect of that was that people who were less coordinated were able to get through and gain a pilot's license, and that meant that people who weren't quite as highly reactive were able to get themselves into trouble they couldn't get themselves out of but yeah that's a different argument everybody these days uses differential ailerons and on sailplanes because their wings are so much longer even having two-thirds up one-third down or three-quarters up one-quarter down you still got the issue of all of that lift and all of that drag so far out away from the center line that sailplanes you have to use rudder. Now this is a VJ24 which I was always told is a production engineered version of a VJ23. The VJ23 I was told it was much harder to make because it has a tapered plan form and it has a tapered wing thickness so you can only make two ribs the same you know one of each on each side. I didn't fully appreciate that it was made pretty much of wood. Uh, this is aluminium. So this is kind of like a production engineered rectangular plan form, untapered wing version of a VJ23. And when I saw Greg Dahl's plywood aileron mixing horn, he seemed quite surprised at it, but to me it was totally familiar because this is the aileron mixing horn on the VJ24W. It was the same on the VJ24E and it was the same on the VJ24. When this thing was originally built, it was a hang glider with two parallel bars. You can still see the aluminium brackets to hold the seat belt on the aluminium bars and your armpits were supposed to go over the top of those bars and a joystick which is currently back behind the I don't know, forward dashboard whatever it is but the VJ24 had this aluminium shelf in front of it and they've simply put a set of rudder bars at the front end of what used to be the shelf at the forward end of the hang cage. So in the original, the aileron control wires come forward to these pulleys, and then they run down here, and that just would have turned around across here, and over here you would have had the mounting for the control stick. So it's been 
rerouted, rerouted. There's your two aileron control wires, one above and one below the parallel tubes. And that's stick central. And that's the mixing bell crank. Full right stick. Left hand side of the bell crank has been pulled forward. Stick central. Very cute, isn't it? It pulls a lot harder than it pushes. So anyway, when this thing changed from the VJ24E, that's with an engine, to the VJ24W, with the wheels, they took the rudder off this where it once upon a time used to be operated by the stick in a straight run back to the tail. Parallel to the elevator wires which join up side by side to their turnbuckles. So here's the point of all this mate. I reckon you will find when you rig the whole thing up that you've got pretty much the same steering geometry as the VJ24 on your VJ23 and when you get things put together you'll find that as well as having as much upgoing aileron as you could ever want you too will have 10 or 12 degrees maybe 15 of down going aileron because you have got some movement in both directions on the actuating horns as they come up the push rods from the mixing bell crank which once upon a time even on this thing used to work the rudder as well and there's yes folks this is in fact What's left of a hang glider whose delusions of adequacy eventually finally morphed into the sort of contrivance you get when a mad scientist is narrowly foiled in their creation of an infernal device. So, Gregory Dahl and Chopper Girl Air War, you be bloody careful playing with them there levitation machines you've got going. As the cliche says, levitation is not in, of itself inherently dangerous, but it is to an even greater degree than the sea, terribly unforgiving of mistakes. And I didn't believe this. I would not. Fence post makes a good dent, doesn't it? Up here. in this video all aeroplanes bite fools so you too be careful while playing with the wing section that Irv Culver designed for foot launching because his good friend Volmer Jensen was personally aesthetically offended by the occurrence of the regalo wing on hang gliders because Volmer Jensen was building more efficient hang gliders in 1948 than Bill Moyes was selling in 1968. Wobbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.